you know, yet not everybody can do this and you need to recognize if it doesn't work, but paper trade if you need to, a simulated account, whatever, get practice, do all you can and give yourself a chance to see if you can do it. And if you can, um, then you got you have a lot of freedom in your life and it's wonderful and use the freedom well to do good. Hello everybody, this is Anthony for Investors Underground. Today, I have the opportunity to speak with a veteran trader who purchased his first penny stock in 1994. He began trading full-time a few years later and has been consistently profitable during that period. He's one of the first to trade alongside Nathan Michaud, making him an early member of the Investors Underground community. In addition to being a trader, he's a husband, father, an active member within his local community. It's an honor for me to get to introduce Mr. Ryan Harbertson. Hello, Ryan. Thank you for being here and taking the time to speak with me today. Love to. Good to do it. Happy to be here, Anthony. Ryan, you bought your first penny stock in 1994. How did you find out about this penny stock? And what was that experience like for you buying and selling a stock? Yeah, so I might even have to take you back further for just a second because I, when I was a kid, I grew up in Portland and I'm a huge um, sports fan. And we got the Oregonian when I was a kid growing up in the 80s mostly. And I would always look at the sports page first, except for one thing. I would look at the, uh, for some reason, at the very top of the Oregonian paper, it would say percentage, highest percentage gainer in the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. It was just up in the corner. And for some reason, for years, I would be like, wait a minute. So that stock went up 300%. I wonder how that happened and stuff. But that wasn't, then I'd quickly go to the sports page so I could you know, check out the Trailblazers and see what's going on. But for some reason, that was always in my head. And then my mom loved mutual funds and investing and she loves all that kind of stuff. And so, so I say that to say that later on, I was going to college, I was married and it was 1994, I think it was 94, and one of my neighbors gave me a hot tip, quote unquote, which is funny. He's he was a stockbroker, and so one day he says to me, Ryan, I know you're kind of interested in the stock market, and there's this, there's a couple stocks you got to buy, and I'm like, tell me about it. And he said they're penny stocks, and so they're not traded normal like normal stocks, but they're penny stocks. But that's because nobody knows about them. But they're going to figure out how to do some amazing stuff. They're on the edge of and I don't even know if this happens now because I don't know anything about medicine, but I think it was something like it was going to go in and check your blood without actually checking going into the skin. Like it was some outside um, blood scanning type of thing. I don't even know. But whatever, it sounded like the greatest thing I'd ever heard. And so uh, I, I said, what's the symbol? He said B-I-G-M. And the other one was I-M-D-D. It's funny, after all these tens of thousands of symbols that I've traded for the last 25, 30 years. I still remember those too. So I had to set up an account. So I called, it was Scott Trade back then. I called Scott Trade. I sent a check in the mail to them and the internet wasn't really going. And so, and I also called my parents and they hardly had any money, but we scrounged up money. They bought it like a thousand dollars worth or something. I had like $500 worth. And so we got the money in there, opened the account. And then I called up and I said, what's it trading at? And the broker said, let me check. And then he got back on the phone and said, it's at 50 cents. And so we bought the amount of shares we could buy at 50 cents and I was all excited. And then the only way to check after that, because the internet wasn't really the world wide web back then wasn't really going. So I had to, uh, I had to wait in the newspaper. And then for some reason they had a few of those symbols that I could look up, but usually I would call like every three or four days and call the guy up and say, could you tell me what BIGM is trading at? And he'd be like, it's uh, 41 by 44 cents. And I'm like, dang it. And then it was like 32 by 36 cents. And it just kept going down over time. And my parents would call and be like, okay, so what's happening? And I'm I'm dirt poor, newly married, in college, trying to survive. And it's like, oh no, I thought our $500 or $1,000 was going to go to 10,000 or 50,000 because it was a hot tip, right? So we were all excited. And um, so anyway, it eventually went down to one penny. And like when I asked the guy, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's good. It's, it's going to be good and everything. But it was just like, wow. And so kind of gave up on it. And a year or two later, the I don't know the exact timing of the Internet, but it seems like in the mid 90s, it became more available. And so eventually 
I was able to go online myself and look up the symbol and it was at one cent and the other one was at like we bought it like a dollar and it was at like a 10 cents i mean they were both down like 90 to 98 percent you know and um your usual penny stock basically and uh so i i tell i call up my dad and i'm like dad this stock this stock is bigm is trading at one cent we could buy ten thousand shares for a hundred bucks i'm all excited and he's like is it you just tell me when it gets over 50 cents on where we bought it at. I'm like, yeah, dang it. And so, you know, a, a month later I, I check it and it's at three cents or whatever. And I'm like, I call him up. I said, dad, our hundred bucks would have gone to 300 bucks if we had bought that thing. He's like, is it at 50 cents yet? And I'm like, okay. So we just kept doing this and finally it got to 10 cents. I don't remember like 96 or something. And in 1996 and i was like dad our hundred bucks would be a thousand if we'd done that forget about the 50 cent thing we would have been able to average down and he's like you just tell me when it gets to 50 cents anyway eventually over time i think in the late 90s when penny stocks started going big again uh it actually went past 50 cents it went up to like a dollar 20 and i think he actually made a little money on it. it only took him you know like eight years or something five six seven eight years but anyway, so that was the start of it for me. But the crazy thing was, for some reason, after that experience, I started saying, wait a minute, if I can go online in my own house and find stocks that are at a penny, I mean, I didn't know back then you could go to one hundredth of a penny, you know, you could just keep losing. But it was like, if I could go do that and find those, maybe I could buy them and then write them up like this one did, because eventually that went up 120 times its value. Maybe I could I could do this. And so that took me down this road. It took me down this road of I started um, looking. Uh, I don't even remember what we used back then. It's obviously it wasn't Google, but doing a word search on InfoSeek or whatever it was called back then. I, I used to I would look up like stock trading and technical analysis. And I just started learning about charts and started learning about things. And I was like, that was the beginning of it for me. That was where I was like. I got to find this. And I started finding other stocks and chat rooms talking about stocks and things like that. And it was like, I was totally interested. I was, I was hooked because I, ever since those early years of watching the percentage gainers and the Oregonian in the newspaper to uh, this stock eventually moving, it was like, I got to figure this out. That's incredible. And I think that's indicative of a lot of people's experience when they first buy stocks, everything from, you know, a hot tip or something that they think is going to be miraculous and, and change the world, even to averaging down on, on their position and sort of what could have been if you had just averaged down. And, and that, that's pretty incredible. Um, did you have success after that stock went to 50 cents and you, or over a dollar rather, and you sold, uh, did you just get more and more interested in stocks and eventually just replenish your account and just keep keep trading that way? Is that kind of how it progressed? And and did you study finance or anything like that uh, in college? I know you had mentioned college. So did you sort of combine that interest or how did that all play out for you? Yeah, good question. No, nothing on finance. In fact, I was doing Spain. I lived in Spain and done a church mission there in Spain. And so I, I spoke Spanish. And so I was studying Spanish. And then um, if you can believe this, I was really interested in meteorology because I, I love the weather. And so I wanted to thought, maybe I want to be a weatherman. And and um, so there was just a lot of options out there. And then maybe I could do a weatherman for the Spanish station, you know, <laughs> the Latino. I was just trying to think of all this stuff. But uh, no, nothing with finance, no idea about the economy, nothing of that. But what I did start doing was like, I remember I found a chat room called the stockpit.com. I don't know if it still exists, but so there's a plug out for something from uh, way back when I I went in there and there was some guys that were really good at trading like they had learned how to read level two. And this was in like 97, 98 ish. I mean, that was pretty unheard of. And they were they were re reading level two and they could see what the market makers were doing and everything else. So so I I can't I um, switched my I think it was then I went to a brokerage called my track and any of the old traders are going to laugh when they hear that. But that was one from way back when. And so I opened up a MyTrack account and used their level two and started learning how to read it. And I just really started, um, I learned how to do scans. So I would run a scan and I, I, I could say, I want all stocks that are within 10% of their 52 week high and that they're 
hitting the high of day today for the third time or whatever, just something to look for a breakout or I want to stock at a 52 week low uh, because I love bounce trades and so on. And so I started doing that and mostly focusing on penny stocks because that had been my first experience. So the OTC was where I kind of cut my teeth and I just started looking at stuff. And I remember I bought a stock called INVT and I told my dad about it. It was scary to tell him about it, but we bought at something like 50 cents and I watched it on level two every day. And I was, and it, and watching the raging bull was one of the websites back then in Silicon investor and these old ones. And so you're reading about people talking about stuff. And it was funny because I never believed any of this stuff. I never really felt for the hype even back then. Like I was always like, these seem like pretty scammy companies and stuff, but whatever this, as long as they go up, who cares? Right. And so it was just more of a, it didn't, I never got it into that. I know most people usually start with like a fundamental, oh, this company's going to the moon because they're doing this. Yeah, I thought that on that very first one, but after it went to nothing and then went up. And I think they even changed what they were doing. You know, later on, that company, BIGM, was like, well, we're now in the dot com something uh, business of something. It was nothing to do with it. So I realized, forget about that. Just look at the chart. And that made me become a technical anal you know, analyst, kind of that being the area I wanted to look at. So anyway, um, I think I I bought that stock with him and we made it from 50 cents to about $2 and 40 cents and sold out for 200% or so. And it was just like, okay, this is good. Like, and my dad was super excited and we just did really well. And, and so that kind of kicked things off. So I finally say to my wife, it's 1999. And I say, and this is the dot com bubble, right? This is where everything is going crazy. You had the big stocks like Cisco and stuff uh, going nuts, but then there was these, just anybody, a guy in his garage just says, I have a business.com, uh, and it didn't matter if he had anything to sell. He, all of a sudden, he was worth $100 million or whatever, and the stocks went nuts. And so so I told my wife, I think I can do this. And by that time, we had little children, and she's just, she was supportive, but she was kind of like, really? Like, this is what you're going to do? And and um, so, yeah, we. I started with $2,000 in that MyTrack account. Uh, this was different than another, that account where I bought that one. And this one is, I wanted to trade, like do re repetitive trades all day long. There was no rule, by the way, back then for $25,000 for pattern day traders. So that changed later on, I think 2001 or 2003 or something like that. And so that silly rule didn't go into place until later, which allowed me a chance to even start um, because I was, I was starting with 2000 bucks. So I feel bad for people today where they're like, it's tougher to get started early on with that. You know, it's, it's tough to say, start, get $25,000. And now we're going to try to learn how to trade. It's like, I was able to start with 2000. And so I asked my wife, I said, um, I think I can do this. Let me give it a shot. And it was towards the end of 99. And I opened up with the $2,000. And in three weeks, I had the 2000 to 26,000. Wow. And I was like, this is the easiest thing I've ever done. This is awesome. That's incredible. So you went from 2000 to over what's now known as the pattern a day trader rule. The, sounded like that's just an incredible time to have been around and able to be trading during that particular period. I can't even describe how thankful I am that I had a few months because it all changed a few months later. but. I, we would run a scan and use my track and run scans and we would find a stock that's at 10 cents that had news with Microsoft for the day or whatever. And they would go from 10 cents to a dollar. I mean, it was the wild, wild west of penny stocks. It was, things were going crazy. And literally, like I said, I went from 2000 to 26,000 in three weeks. And I'm like, I told my wife, I'm like, this is, we're going to be billionaires. Like, this is crazy. You just do the math on this. I thought it was going to be that easy. <laughs> it seems so silly looking back. So. Uh, so things were going good. January of 2000 comes and then February and then March hits. And if anybody looks in the record in the history books, they'll know that in March, I think it was about March 15th of 2000, uh, Alan Greenspan was the Fed chair. And all of a sudden he said, I think we have irrational exuberance in the markets and the markets just crashed. And if I remember right, the NASDAQ was at 5,000, almost exactly at the highs in March of 2000. And it dropped to 1100, if I have that right. I think it was an 82% drop or whatever. And it's like, 
So when we talk about drops now, you know, like COVID and stuff, no, this was a huge drop. And so that affected how everything was, how you trade and how you do stuff. And I was struggling. Like, I was like, this is not easy. Like news isn't working anymore. You buy a stock on news, it doesn't go up. You buy a stock on scan, it, it doesn't go up very long. And things aren't working. The story stocks weren't working. Nothing was working. And then the next year was 9-11. I mean, here I was trading in the morning in, on the West Coast. And, you know, I think I even had a, so, sometimes I had a child on my, one of my laps when I'm trading. You know, it was crazy. Like, don't push that button. You just lost daddy $20,000. You know, it was like <laughs> just crazy times as a young dad. But but 9-11 happened. I remember trading that morning and then realizing what it was. And then they halted the markets. But there was just so much stuff like that and so much turmoil and so much selling and so much air came out of that dot-com bubble that I had to relearn how to trade. I had to learn how to short. I had to learn how to buy puts instead of just calls. I mean, it's not hard. You just click the button. But it's like I didn't, in my mind, I wasn't thinking short. I was always looking long because of penny stocks. You generally back then couldn't short a penny stock. So it was like, you got to look long. So I'm I'm on the long side. And so that's what I was trying to do. And so I had to relearn everything over the next couple of years because it was it was tough. Trading changed. I had to adapt, basically. And how were you able to adapt? Was it all just trial and error? Or were you learning lessons from other traders and and talking with them, learning things on on websites and things like that in order to just continue this amazing career that you had started? Good question. I mean, I, I, I had some mentors, like just some in chat rooms where I just would watch, they were really good at what they did. You know, they, I just would watch and learn. I'd ask them questions and just say, well, I don't, how did you, I don't understand how you did this or why, why did you short right there? Why did, how did that work? And, Oh, well, I was, you know, and they would they would describe what they looked at or even things that I had never thought of that were more fundamental things, which I usually am just a technical person. But to have them say, well, no, I checked. I just looked at their financials and they have a ton of stock to sell and they got to dilute down to this or this. And it was like, so I went short the company. I'm like, oh, OK, I got to learn a little more about what's going on here. Like it had been so easy and so like taking candy from a baby. It was just like. This is the greatest thing ever that I had to learn to be a complete trader. And there were people that would help me that I would ask questions with. And they they would just I I just learned. I just and I'd be in a chat room and I would just listen to the conversations and watch and read message boards and just learn. And I don't mean the crazy stuff like this stock's going to the moon type of message boards, you know, where I, I mean, stuff where it was like people that were really having good discussions arguing about why it would go up or down and why and what's the what does the chart look like and why do you like this versus that and. So it really helped me to have people. I would have, I would not have been able to make it as a trader if, in those early years, I didn't have people around me that I was able to ask questions about, or that I could look up online and learn. They're just, I needed that. I had to have that. And right now, there's so many more resources. Uh, back then, it feels like it was still kind of the newer, and so I needed people who could point me in the right direction of where to look something up or, or how to learn. Um, what a pattern was on a chart, a certain pattern I was looking for or whatever. Yeah. One of the things that strikes me is that you were interested in furthering your education, learning more and being open, it sounds like, to adapting and learning how to short or learning how to, you know, uh, use a put or adapting basically just to what the market was offering. Is this something that you found really distinguished those who stay in the market versus those who do well for a while and then just kind of sputter out? Yeah, I think, I don't know for sure, but it seems like between the hundred or two, between a couple chat rooms I was in and people that were basically trading full time, there were maybe 200 of us doing that back in 99 and 2000. And I, I felt, I feel like a couple, three years later, going through the dot-com burst, bubble burst and 9-11 9-11 and all those things. Um, I felt like by the, I can't say for sure because people could have just left and done something else, but it seems like people were just dropping like flies. And by two, three, four years later, there were three or four of us left that were trading from those hundreds that were trading before. Some of them who I thought, these are the greatest traders I've ever seen. Like they were so good at what they did. Like they could run a scan for a penny stock and then buy that thing and make 
50,000 or 100,000 in a day back then. And it was just, uh, I made, my mind was blown. Like, I'm just like, how did they, how are they so good at finding where, when the stock is going and getting on their first on the news and, and watching level two and seeing that Goldman Sachs was buying on the bid and pushing the stock up and, you know, all the things that was, we were trying to learn to watch and everything. And, and, and yet when the, and pen, the penny stock market is a different animal. So that thing, of course, has had amazing runs. Even up until the COVID time, we had a crazy run in penny stocks in 2020, 2021 or whatever. Uh, whereas now it's completely dead. It, um, it goes in waves. But the point was that when it had its drop also, a lot of those guys just seemed to disappear. They didn't learn how to trade listed stocks or how to trade uh, or, or maybe even swing trade something different or just just adapting learning how to do it and those that didn't just slowly their accounts dwindled and i remember one guy telling me and he had made millions and he was down to literally a dollar or two in his account and i was just thinking how is that possible like you were so good at this and he was like yeah i gotta go get a regular job i gotta work a job i'm done i, I keep losing money and uh, and i just remember thinking i don't want that to happen because i love this so much i love trading i love the freedom it gives me i love that i don't have a boss i love that i can sit in my shorts and t-shirt and flip-flops and trade and then go surfing at the beach or i can go to hike a mountain or i can do this or i can go to my kids game. i can do all this stuff and it's like i'm so excited about this i can't imagine having a regular job so i almost out of the fear of the idea of going to get a regular job <laughs> Because I, I didn't finish school. I made it till my junior year in college. And 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 I just, it's not for me. I wasn't great in school. And most of my family was really good in school and four-point students and everything. I just wasn't me. I struggled to do it. And yet I found this thing with stocks that it was so interesting to me of learning how to do it that I just thought I could I can do this. And, um, but the fear of having to ever go get a real job <laughs> that I was so afraid of that, that it forced me to adapt. I, it forced me to learn. It forced me to even things I hated. Like I didn't understand shorting to me. I understood what it was, but I just thought that's no good. Like I don't, why, you know, why I have to do the short side. I mean, that, but over time realizing stocks go up, stocks go down, who cares the order. I even remember thinking, because I talked to people who said shorting's evil, for example, you know, it's bad. You want it to go down. And then over time, I went, wait a minute. All it is is the reversal. Instead of buying first, selling second, you're selling first and buying second. You know, it was, it was like, what? Well, there's nothing. Who cares? That's no difference. You're still providing the same liquidity in and out both ways at, both, at just different times. And so little things in my mind to change to go, OK, learn how to do this, to do that. And so I I really had to adapt and, and uh, learn and find other people. And by the way, about that time, uh, a young 18 year old punk, I think he was uh, named Nate came along who, who was, who was trading penny stocks trading. Uh, he and I would even trade Apple together, like, you know, a thousand shares of Apple or whatever back then. And we were trading everything, but uh, I, I can't remember how he first found us or how we first connected, but he was this young guy. I remember thinking, man, he's, he's going to be a good trader. He's doing really well. And so, um yeah fun to fun to have that come full circle all these years later to be talking about it <laughs> you must have seen a lot of traders come and go but also a lot of different markets and market cycles and, and trends and ups and downs um would you say that dot com sort of bubble popping was one of the harder markets to navigate over the years when, when you look back or were you know where does something like 2020 covid um, so, so that's compare. what's so amazing is because it's a great question because learning how to trade when a market drops every single day in the dot com bubble, not every day, but you know, a lot of dropping made it so that my best years ever was the 2008, 2009 financial crisis that came up a few years later. And then also COVID the huge, I mean, we had circuit down days of the, of the S and P like we had crazy moments, right. That we just lived through a few years ago. I love those were my best moments of trading because it's like I had gone through the war early on with the dot com bubble burst that when the next one came along, it was like, I know how to do this. I know how to short. I know how to buy puts. And then I know when it's time and and everybody's crying that it's over with. I think we're going to get a huge bounce. And 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 we did. And of course, I always am in too early and out too early. But I I mean, I remember days in 2008, 2009 when Bank of America 
had gone gone down to about three dollars BAC, and it, and sometimes I'm putting a bid in for like ten thousand shares at three dollars, and just getting whacked, and I'm going, who who has shares left to sell? It's down to nothing. It's almost a it, it, like, and then I started thinking we may have a run on the banks, which we almost did. I mean, Washington Mutual overnight was bought by JP Morgan, I think. And there was a bunch of crazy moments at that time. But the point was, in my mind, I I thought, okay, if there's a run on the banks and it's over with, then money won't matter anyway. So whatever, it doesn't matter. But if it's right that this will have a bounce and that they'll save the banks and so on, then this is a great you know, this is a great time to be buying everything. And, and it was, and it had, we had a huge rebound. They came in with that big tarp thing, you know, and saved everything. And so, and then same with COVID it's like, you start, I mean, there was a moment during COVID my office window is, is right over here. And I had a moment when the markets were halting down during COVID where I thought this looks familiar. This seems like the dot com bubble burst. And it seems like the 2008 financial crisis. And I, I literally looked out my window and said, well, there's no bodies out in the street. The children are still playing on the swing across the street at the Goodman home. That means I think that we're going to make it through this COVID thing. And I think we're going to survive. So I think I got to play these bounces. I got to I got to buy sometimes. I mean, I short it also, but it's like I'm also going to play the rebound. And again, had I known the rebound we were going to have, I would have made a lot more going longer calls and uh, so on. But the point was. I had seen this, but I've seen this before. And so you start seeing these cycles and when they come again, it's like, wait a minute. I go back into the memory logs and it's like, I can do this. I know what happens and there is a rebound and it, and it does happen. So you can play both sides of it. That's great. And having that experience definitely comes in handy and you're able to profit on it, you know, years and, and decades down the line. So for those traders who are able to, you know, learn and adapt to the market, learn about market cycles and, and whatnot. Yeah. It seems like that's that's the way to go is to just keep learning, being able to adapt. Is that accurate to say? Yep. And I and I'll say this also, Anthony. I think that while you have to keep adapting, you have to keep adapting because I mean we didn't have high frequency when I was first trading. The market, for example, was trading with fractions, right? So so Microsoft was seventy eight dollars and a quarter by seventy eight and five sixteenths or whatever. I don't even remember that. <laughs> Sounds so old now doing it that way. But I used to scalp in the spread of those those uh, fractions. And I had my software would actually let me buy a thousand shares on the bid and then put it right on the ask with one sixteenth of a of a fraction lower than what it was quoting at. And I mean, all this crazy stuff. Well, then eventually it went to $76.01 cent by 76.02. And there was no spread in there big enough for me to trade that. So I couldn't do that anymore. I had to learn something else. There wasn't really high frequency trading algorithm stuff as much. I felt like I was competing against humans where now it feels like crazy, right? Bots out there. Everything's trading AI stuff really fast. And so, yeah, you have to keep adapting. But having said all that, there are principles that are the exact same principles that I was learning in 1999 that apply in 2023. Principles meaning uh, if you chase if you chase a stock or you chase something that you want, in the end, that might work a couple of times, but in the end, you're gonna end up losing more than you gain when you when you when you don't wait for your spot, you know, when you chase it instead because you missed it and then you're like, I don't care, I gotta get it, right? Or uh, add, adding down to a loser. And that's one of my biggest weaknesses is averaging into a loser because I like to trade huge bounces. So I like when a stock is dropped. I like when Tesla the other day has dropped from almost 300 to 211 or 215. I'm thinking here comes a huge reversal, but it's no good if you're buying in trenches and I'm talking intraday. If you're buying these trenches and you're buying in there and and you're buying and you're using options like I usually do, you can be down 80% on your position in, in an hour buying that way. So averaging down in has killed me sometimes where it's like, no, wait, wait till it's set up, wait till the bottom. It's better to catch it on that way up on the first pullback after the real bottom and then start going. Like there's just these things where that was true in 1999 and it's true in 2023. There's certain things that if you follow them, certain rules, uh, that you have each trader has to come up with but i bet if we all compared our notebooks which we do sometimes it's kind of like oh yeah same same basic rules like don't trade when you're mad don't trade when you're bored don't chase don't average into a loser don't i mean these things that sound so simple but man those are the difference between making it or not making it yeah 
Absolutely. Those are an evergreen set of rules that I think every trader who's who's traded long enough definitely learns probably the hard way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In fact, I relearn those thousands of times over the hard way. I like to, I'm hard headed. I like to see if it changed or not. Yeah. And then I find, no, nope, I still lose the same way when I do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you and me both, Ryan. <laughs> uh, um, th that leads me to one of the topics that I wanted to discuss with you, which is about your trading style. You know, over the years, what has your trading style evolved into? What type of stocks are you interested in, in uh, trading these days? Yeah. So, when the penny stock market is going, when it's hot, when there's volume, I, I look at number of trades. So, and I look at, I want at least a thousand trades in a security of an OTC or pink stock or whatever. When there's at least a thousand trades in that security um, and there's 10 or 20 of those on scan, then the OTC market is going great. When that's going, that's, I'll be honest, that's still my first love from 1994 to 2023. It's still when that goes, I feel like I know that market better than anything. And level two means more than anything on that because of diluting, you know, market makers and so on, finance deals, everything else. So that's my favorite. Right now that's dead. So then I go to the next things that I love. And those are generally trading options um, and futures also, but I trade futures on the ES and I trade the S the SPY, the SPY, and the SPX. I trade those options on those um talk about scary the spx those are you know big movers when the spy moves a certain amount the you know the calls might go from three dollars to 30 and back down to zero all within an hour on the spx but i love trading that uh, i also love trading amazon tesla google the the bigger ones but i usually trade options with all of those and and i do trade um i'm in uh iu and so in Investors Underground, uh, most of the stuff that's brought, there's a lot that's brought up in there and there's different channels, but in the main momentum one, um, and Nate's in there, he's generally trading the small cap stocks, not always, but usually the small cap stocks, things that are moving from a dollar to $5 or $10 and things like that. And so I love trading those also. I don't trade the short side as much as he does. Uh, he's better at that than I am, um, but I trade puts a lot on these bigger stocks just as much as i go long long and short but yeah so i basically trade everything from penny stocks all the way up to the to the s p to everything in between okay and how do you scan for stocks or find the tickers and setups that you want to trade on any given day yeah i used to um so years ago i think it was called equity feed now it's called scans i've used that forever I love that for scanning and setting up parameters of what I'm looking for. And then behind me, I mean, you probably can't see it, but I have scans going even from IU that are in there now that are that are amazing. So you can have high of day, low of day, and just different things happen. You can choose different things in there. Uh, and so it's very simple to look for what you're looking for. If you're looking for a high of day break, if you're looking for a low of day, low of the day, whatever, whatever it might be you're looking for. Um, speaking of scans, I have to... If we have time, I have to tell you a story that I think people will be will find pretty um, pretty interesting. I'm looking on a scan. This is probably I don't even know, 2005 or something. I'm looking on a scan, and I find this stock on the scan that has the weirdest symbols ever. It was like, it was like uh, X X Z Z Y Y or something. I don't even know. And I'm like, what in the world? I've never seen this before. So I right click on it, open up the the daily chart. And then I, I'm like, there's no way. And it was going from like a dollar to a thousand dollars to a dollar to a thousand. And so then I pull up the intraday and the thing's been at like 300 to a thousand back to 300 to a thousand. And I'm like, okay, this doesn't. So I have a buddy and, and, uh, he still trades his name's Andy. And I'm saying to Andy, um, he's in IU also. And so we private message each other and I'm like, Andy, check out this symbol check out the symbol. And he goes, what is that? And I'm like, I have no idea, but it goes from like a dollar to a thousand every day. What are we doing? I couldn't find any options on it. So I'm like, this is crazy though. We got to do this. So anyway, at the end of the day, it starts dropping from like a hundred to 50 to 40, 30, 20, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, and level two is working and everything. And I'm like, it gets to like two or $3 and we start buying. So I buy like a thousand shares or whatever. He buys like a thousand shares for real. It's in our account. And 
all of a sudden it drops to 50 cents. We're like, okay. I mean, it, it was moving so quick. We're like, what's going on? So we, we buy more. We, we, we average down like we're not supposed to. We average down again. And, and finally the market closes and, and it's now dropped to like eight cents or something from a thousand earlier in the day. And we're like, there's no news. There's nothing on it. And we're like, this is the craziest ever. So, so we start bidding it up. I start putting bids in and he starts putting bids in at like eight and 10 cents. And all of a sudden it starts going 20 cents, 30 cents. And we start buying more. And like our bids were affecting it. Like, we're like, what's going on here? It's, that's not supposed to work this way on a, on a NASDAQ stock or whatever. And, and I mean, I don't even know, but the bottom line was we were down huge. And then all of a sudden it started rebounding and after hours, and then it starts going $2, $3, $4, $5. And it starts shooting up. And we're like, Oh my goodness, we're up huge six figures. So, so we got to sell. So I click sell and it says, cannot perform the transaction. You have to call your broker or whatever. And I'm like, what in the world? So the, 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 I always have several brokers at a time, brokerage firms, you know, and this one was with a smaller firm because that was the one that was letting me buy it. And so I call them up after hours. I'm like, Hey, I'm trying to sell my, at least sell part of my position on this thing. I'm up huge. It's crazy. And he looks it up and he goes, what is that stock? And I'm like, I have no idea. And he's like, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. So he tries to put the order through and it doesn't go through, but it's still in my account and it's showing a huge you know, um, unrealized gain in there. And I'm just like, please sell it, sell it. Cause I have no idea what, you know, what's next. Finally, he says, I got to put you on hold and call down to the floor. He calls down to the floor and for five minutes, he's got us on Andy and I are on with him. We're, you know, we're, he finally gets back on with us and says, how did you find this stock? And I said, I found it on scan. It was just showed up on scan today. He said, yeah, you just discovered the NASDAQ test symbol. It's only for the computer to run from like a penny to a thousand to a penny several times a day and everything because it just does some algorithm thing to, to just make sure things are working properly. And I'm like, no. I said, but I bought it. He goes, yeah, that was a fluke. You can't actually buy it. It doesn't exist. Nobody's allowed to even see it. It's just for like the computer guys behind the scene. Well, somehow I had found it, bought it, got down huge and then got up huge. And the whole thing was a scam. I mean, the whole thing wasn't even real. It was not even, it was the funniest, it was the funniest hour or two I've ever had in trading. I mean, we're like, we went from, you know, down hundred thousand to up a few hundred thousand thinking that, that it was the greatest trade ever to, to like, Oh, never mind. He says, yeah, I'll just cancel it out of your account. It doesn't exist. And I never saw the symbol again. I couldn't find it. I tried looking for it and stuff, but I was like, anyway, kind of a classic. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That that's got to be quite quite an emotional roller coaster to yeah. to have to, to go on. <laughs> and, and I should have bought more. Oh wait, it doesn't matter. It doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure some engineer somewhere had a had to have a, a discussion with his his boss about this test. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somebody was fired. Somebody was fired. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Well, for the stocks that you do uh, end up buying that actually exist, Brian, um, is there a particular <laughs> time of day? Uh, when you are more active uh, and yep. pr prefer to trade these these stocks, yeah, usually the first ninety minutes of the day, and I'm done. Yeah, I know a lot of people don't trade the first hour because they want to see some trends set up and so on. But I like the volatility. For me, I love volatility, so I like those fast moves in the first 15, 20, 30 minutes of the day. There's usually a big drop and then a reversal or a, or a big spike and then a drop. And, I, and I'm and i trying to play both sides of those. And I like that. So it's um, for me, it's the first like 60, 90 minutes of the day, maybe two hours. And then I'm usually gone. I go grab the paddleboard, stand up paddleboard and go to the river or go fly fishing with my son or something. And um, so I and then I might come back for the last half hour or something. But I've made. In fact, years ago, I really looked at it and it was for me, I had made something like 95% of all of my profits in the first 90 minutes of the day and generally had either broke even or lost the next several hours in the middle of the day, you know, when the New York side's going to lunch and everything. And uh, I, I'm now in the mountains standard time, but I was West Coast all those years until we moved here six years ago. So I'm so, you know, I was trading 6.30 in the morning was the open of the market. So it was 6.30 till about 8, 8.30 and it was done and it got slow. And so, yeah, I, I, I'm really into that first hour or two and then I'm, I'm done. It's like I try to extract my money from the market and then go on with life. 
that's really interesting. I definitely want to talk about some of that work and life balance that you that you have because I think that's incredible. For those first 90 minutes, are there any particular technical indicators that you favor on your charts or or anything else that you think is really helpful to look at uh, during that that first 90? When I it's funny, it's kind of like I have four monitors now. I, I used to have I think 8 was my the max I had. It's like for me over the years, less has become more. And so like, I'm probably a better trader on my laptop than I am with these, even, even these screens here. Like, I feel like there's less noise and I can focus in on what I'm doing. And yet I love to have all the info coming at me here. But once I've made or got into a trade, it's better for me to walk away or look at my phone or something. Cause if I look at too much info, it's, it, it's easy to get to lose the conviction. But um. And so the same is true about indicators. I used to have, I mean, I had, okay, now that I've learned all this stuff, I've got the Bollinger Bands and the MACD and the RSI, and I've got 50 different indicators going, and I've got, you know, so many different things happening with it. And over time, I have literally slimmed down to VWAP on my intraday, you know, just like one and three minute charts and volume weighted average price. And then, um, just a couple moving averages and that's it along with volume. And so for whatever reason, for me, it's much easier. Those other things, I feel like I see them when I look at a chart without needing to have them on the chart. I see them. Uh, and, and so it's funny, less has become more for me over the decades of trading where it's like, I just, I just don't need all of that stuff. And that's not to say there's anything wrong with that. Somebody else might have a million indicators and do great with it. It's just like I didn't need all that. I, I it almost became too much because then it's like, well, yeah, but this is agreeing with this, but this one is disagreeing, and I, I just didn't need so much of that. In fact, to be honest with you, most of the time I feel like I can look at a chart, and I don't know if it's all the screen time or what over the last thirty years, but it's just like I can see it in 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 a second if it's like, oh, I'm interested in this or no, <laughs> you know, I'm, there's something there, there's a setup there, or there isn't, you know. And so I'm looking for really simple patterns i'm really i'm looking at let's say amazon spiked in the morning i'm really looking for just is this going to become a bull flag right here and as it creates that flag out there the pennant then I'm, I'm waiting for that first moment of the turn to load up on the calls for that next leg up on the spike off of that and just simple things like that it's just like it's funny to think that if i could talk to myself 20 years ago and say, oh, you don't need so much of this stuff, but maybe having all those things earlier helped me to see what I needed to to eventually scale it down to to what I need now. So maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. And what does your pre-market or even post-market uh, routine look like? You know, what what time of the day and how much time do you do you put in to finding the stocks that you might want to trade? Yeah, I don't put in a lot because. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't be the guy to write a book about putting in a whole lot of hours on stuff. At night, I like to look at the charts for just a few minutes of the ones that I trade, like the SPY or Tesla or Amazon or Google or the big ones. And then and, and then in the morning, just see where they open up. And I already have an idea from the night before that it's like, okay, I think they were going to be bouncing. So let's see how they open up. If they're red, then I'm looking for a red to green move. If they're green, I'm going to wait and see if they come down and test where the lows of yesterday or whatever it might be. Um, and then as far as the small caps that I trade, just in and out of stuff that's three, four, five dollars that Nate trades a lot of, those are showing up daily. So you can't really even prep for a lot of those. I mean, they might that morning they had news of FDA approval or something like that. And so I just see the high a day scan or any of the volume scans that are going and just see, look for unusual activity and then just pull up the chart and start trading from there. Yeah. So but I don't I have less prep work than most, but I feel like I used to have to put in way more hours uh, and it made, I needed to do that in order to be ready at night, studying charts and then getting everything ready and then writing down. I had my, okay, this spot, this position, this, this is where I want to buy if it does this. And, and now it's on a post-it note. I might put, you know, just one stock like uh, Tesla. I like the low 210 to 215 area for a bounce. It's come down from almost 300 and, and so I'll just put a little note there. And so when it gets close to be watching, or I'll put an alert actually on the stock, on the software to just give me a, a ding when it's when it hits that. But but yeah, I I definitely um do way less than probably the average professional trader that does this for a living. Um it's just kind of been dialed in that less is more for me. 
And Ryan, do you use Investors Underground or any of the tools uh, throughout the day, whether you're looking for stocks to trade or uh, ideas for stocks to trade? Yeah, so I use the scanners that they have now, which are awesome. There's different ones on there. I use those. There's a pre-market scan and so on to see what's moving beforehand when I wake up. Because I don't get up as early as you, the, the, well, I don't know where, the East Coast guys that are, you know, what I'm saying is, they don't have to get up as early as I do, uh, being mountain standard time. And I'm not willing to get up at four in the morning or whatever. So it's like, you know, I have to catch up and see what's on scan and what's going on, what I've missed from the East Coasters. But um, so I use IU for those scans. I use it for the chat of what's going on in there. And then to be honest, I just have a couple people, including Nate, that we just um private message. I open up a box on the side and we just message back and forth on something we're trading. A couple of traders that I really uh, respect that we bounce stuff off of for years and years and years and years. And we just share ideas or share our pain or our victories and just kind of have something to somebody to bounce some off of. So for me, it's a community where there's been a, just a handful of people that I've connected with over the years. And just uh, I use that to be able to message and so on back and forth. If you're looking for stock scanning tools, idea generation, or improving your trading in general, Investors Underground might be able to help. You'll have access to courses and mentors to learn from, some of the best technology available for scanning stocks and breaking news, and access to the chat rooms, where you'll find a vibrant community of focused traders who share their ideas in real time every single day. You'll also have access to Nate's morning broadcast the midweek study session with Sam, webinars, moderator watch lists, and all the other resources that Investors Underground has to offer. Listeners of the podcast can access special deals at investorsunderground.com slash YouTube. And now back to our interview with Ryan. And that's actually a topic that I wanted to discuss with you, Ryan, which is about trading peers and how they've been able to influence you uh, and you've been able to influence one another over the years. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, your trading network? I know you had mentioned that you met Nate when he was he was young and and trading OTCs. So what's that relationship been like? And and what's the impact been of your trading network? Yeah, so. Yeah, Nate is awesome and he's been great. And I have a couple guys like Nate where. Honestly, what we don't have to tell each other, hey, this stock, look at the setup. This looks good. It's more like, um, man, I'm eyeing this thing. What do you think? And the other person's like, I like it too. And it's just kind of a confirmation of something. But I'll tell you, Anthony, honestly, the biggest thing that's been the biggest blessing, I think, for me has been the connection with guys like Nate and a couple other traders that I respect where when you have a terrible trade, when you break all of your rules, when you've lost three days in a row, which sounds like nothing, but you know, when, if you've, if you've been green 30 days in a row and, and you have three days where you're red, it's crazy. You wouldn't think a guy like me who's done this so long, but I still start thinking, can I do this? Uh, can I still do this? Is there, is there something I, am I, am I no longer capable of making money as a trader? Um, when you have those moments to be able to pick up the phone and call a buddy like Nate and say, man, I just got killed. Um, I remember I, I had a moment uh, and we've all had several moments, you know, Nate's has one ones where he's called me, especially a guy who's who shorts so heavily. It's easy to get caught in some of those crazy ones. And he's got, he's so good at now trying to avoid all of that stuff. But man, over the years, there was times you get those moments like the, these I won't mention all the symbols, but you know the ones where they just went, you know, from ten dollars to a hundred or to a thousand, just crazy stuff. Where you kind of, if you for a second blink and break your rules and add to a loser, you can blow up an account really easily. And um, I remember I had a moment uh, probably two years ago where I was trading Amazon options on Amazon. And it was the day, and this broke a rule of mine. One of my rules is don't trade that hour after the Fed. You know, it was for me, it's at 12 o'clock when the Fed makes an announcement and they were coming out with their rate 
change what they were going to do. And so I just find it's better. I love volatility, but that's such a crazy moment that it's kind of like, just let it settle a little bit and then start trading. And I didn't. And I, I, I was sticking with it because I was frustrated and I was trading Amazon. And um, this was before Amazon's last split. So it was still making like $100, $200 moves in a day it could make, you know, where now it's trading at a hundred bucks, but then it was like 3000. It was, so it could go from 2,800 to 3,000 or whatever. It was making these huge moves. And, and I, I had been frustrated because a couple of times I, during that day, I just started getting everything wrong where I was long the calls, pretty good size. And then finally it would stop out for a loss. And then it would do the exact move I had been hoping for. And then I would go short. I'd, I'd have puts pretty good size and finally couldn't take the pain. So I would stop out and then it made the exact move I thought. So it's like, okay, I lost 7,000 here. I lost 10,000 there. And in both cases, it was a 20 or $30,000 gain the other way within seconds or minutes. And it's just like, oh, so this was already in my head, which another rule is when I'm having those moments, walk away for a few minutes and reset and refocus and go smaller. I didn't do any of that. Now the Fed announcement comes and I'm already upset and I want to get green for the day. And I'm like, and I'm, I never even usually trade this time of day. I'm usually gone. And so anyway, Amazon finally starts making this reversal and goes, starts moving. And I had been long right before that. And again, stopped out for the third time. And so now I was down pretty good for the day and it, it started making this move and it was like, oh yeah, I'd be up 50,000. Oh, I'd be up a hundred thousand now on these calls. I'd be up 150,000, like just crazy, which for some guys, that's not the, for me, that's huge. I still don't trade huge, huge sides. Well, it kept going and I started buying, it was now like 30 minutes till the close. And I started buying puts with, they were going to expire in 30 minutes, you know, zero days till expire. And no, nothing on the chart said to do it other than the things run like 200 points, you know, and it was like, it's got to take a dip. I don't care. It's got to take a dip. And the fact I'm mad because I was just in a position a hundred points earlier that would have made me huge. And so I start buying puts and buying puts and throwing good money after bad. And, and, uh, it's bad. Like I'm looking at it. My average was at like $20 on these puts. And all of a sudden it was, they were trading at $10, $8, $7, $6, $5, $4. And I hadn't stopped out and I was still buying. And next thing I know, I'm in like $300,000 worth of those puts on Amazon. And I'm like, all oh, I've averaged down so much, breaking every rule, but still thinking all I need is for it to dip like 10 bucks of the 200 point move it's made. And I think I'll break even or make a little bit of money and get out of this nightmare. And it wouldn't, and it didn't. And it kept upticking on air and there was zero dips. And finally, I just said, I can't, there was like eight minutes left in the day or something. And I sold uh, for, I think it was $165,000 loss, which it would have been a $350,000 loss just eight minutes later because they went to zero. But I, I walked out of the room. My wife's like, Hey, how's, how'd the day go? And it was like, yeah, I'm going to go um, throw up in the backyard. I think is how the day went. And uh, anyway, I, I called Nate and uh, just said, and another guy that, that I, I really like that's an IU that I just, just quietly, we talked back and forth and I just told him I got killed on this trade. And what'd you do wrong? Oh, I only added about 27 times to a loser. <laughs> after the Fed decision with nothing in the chart telling me there was a reason, no setup, nothing. I mean, I could list A through Z, all of the rules that I broke. But I, you know, you got this, buddy. Hey, Harb, you got this. You can do that. You know, you can do this. Start tomorrow. Start small again. He's giving me the pep talk. Start small. Uh, look for your setup. Wait. Don't try to get it all back tomorrow in the first trade. Do what you know to do. You've done this forever. You you got this. You got this. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye. You know, that that kind of discussion. And we've had that discussion back and forth both ways. Me with him. You know what you're doing. Go small again. You got caught in a nightmare. You you know what you can do different the next time. You know, you know, and there's something about having somebody who's been in the trenches with you, who's been in the wars, who understands what it's like to tell you, you got this. You can do this. You know what you've done wrong. You can correct this. You don't have to get it all back tomorrow. Start small, refocus. Don't trade anymore today. Go back at it tomorrow or take a couple of days off. Just all these little things that, that we feel helps us. 
but to hear it from somebody else. Um, and I'll be honest, there's, there's, there's been times I, and I'm thankful. Uh, I had the greatest wife in the world. Um, she's the most supportive ever always has been. And, and you need somebody like that, or at least if you have somebody fighting against that, I can't imagine it. You know, if, if you have a significant other to have them say, you got this, you can do this has made all the difference when we have five children and now they're all out of the home, but when they were little and I basically have them on my lap while I'm trying to trade and she's staying at home as a mom, the pressure was so great. I remember times before the 25 K rule, I had 5,000 in my account. And I mean, I had to make 5,000 that month to pay the bills, to pay the mortgage, to cover everything and get food on the table. So I need to make a hundred percent of my money every month. And it was so much pressure because I get it to 10,000, but I got to take 5,000 out. I never got a chance to breathe. You know, it was like, okay, well, here we go again, double my money again. And thankfully we would, and take the money out and do it. I mean, but the pressure of that is great. And if you don't have a support system and people that can, uh, they say, you got this, you can do this. If you don't have that, I, for me personally, I couldn't have made it. I needed that. I needed a wife like that. And I needed um, people like Nate and others who have just been uh, able to lift me up and say, you got this. Ryan, aside from trading peers, how important is it for you to have a support system, whether it's a significant other or family in your life away from trading? Yeah, I think my I have five sisters and and my brother-in-laws are incredible. But I've heard some of my sisters say before, man, I don't know how your wife does it. I could never, I could never, I, I need my, I need a regular paycheck from, you know, I need my husband to do his regular career and everything. And so I had, a, for me, it was, I have a most amazing wife ever. Like I mentioned earlier, she, she's just so supportive. She's always been like, you can do this. You got this. You can do it. You've done it for years. Even when I've had, you know, drawdowns where it's like, okay, but you've done this, you've seen this before, you've got through it, you can do this. And so, yeah, in the same way, reaching out to other traders is amazing. Having people around you in your life, whether they know, she knows nothing about level two or charts or any of those things, but she, she knows me and she knows how to, she knows the, the things I need to hear to help me have the confidence to keep going if I've had a rough time and to make it. So I feel like um, if you don't have, when I first started trading, it was such an, there weren't a lot of day traders. And when I start, started in the late nineties into 2000, it was kind of this, you can't trade for a living kind of a thing. And I think still people, you know, if I get on a plane and somebody says, where are you going? Oh, we're going on vacation for this. And then they say, what do you do for a living? I said, I trade the stock market. And they're just like, oh, well, yeah, you, since COVID or, you know, I'm like, well, no, since the late nineties. And they're like, what? So it's actually your job, but what, how else do you get money? No, that's my job. That's what I do. That's my income. And uh, that's almost hard for people to understand because it's usually dabbling in it or something like that. And so you need people that actually believe you can do it. Or you need people that, that support you instead of like, come on, you can't do this. You can't do this. And even my wife in the beginning, way back in the beginning was like, really though, you can make money and we could pay the bills. And I said, I think I can do this. Too. Well, then I believe you, you know, and off we went. So. I kind of feel like in life, it's like that with everything. If you don't surround yourself with people who are supportive. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, sometimes the most supportive thing, the best thing someone can say is stop, stop trading right now. You're strong, you know, you're whatever, you know, sometimes you need to be slapped in the face and told you're headed the wrong direction or whatever. I'm not saying it's always just um, yes, 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 yes. But when you know you can do this and you and you're plugging forward and you have a history and you can do this, then having somebody remind you of that is wonderful. Yeah. Supporting you in that. Yeah, absolutely. And shout out to all the significant others of, of traders who don't know anything about level two and <laughs> are okay with living with sort of the uncertainty that can come with, with, you know, being married to, or, you know, involved with yep. trading because it yeah. can seem so, so new and odd to everybody. You yes. Know, unless you're actually trading. Yeah. So true. So true. One of the questions I had, Ryan, was for those who are interested in maybe venturing out and meeting other traders. You know, what advice would you give in terms of being able to to meet others? How can traders meet one another and develop 
these types of, you know, relationships. And it sounds like in your case, you know, bonds with yeah. you know, other traders. A few different ways I can think of, like in person, for example, investors underground will do um, be involved with, with traders for a cause. And so people can get together and hear others talk and share ideas and basically just network together. And then uh, for me, a lot of it's just been from my office where it's just been, like I say, these private messages of people over time. So it's it's funny. It seems to just kind of happen like as as you're trading in a room and posting something. Um, and I and I rarely ever actually post, which is funny these days. I just I, I read what's going on, like in the momentum chat. I just you'll never see me post in there. But in the background, I'm messaging with a few people back and forth about stuff. Um, so you can do that by reaching out. Uh, and I don't even know 100 percent if this is right, but. I one time looked on there on the chat because I never really played around with the buttons and realized there was something that said, find traders near you. Does that still work? So yeah, I would say like you could put parameters and say within 50 miles or hundred miles. And I actually clicked that at once. I was like, wow, there's some traders in here from nearby. Haven't ever connected with them, but I did have a couple people do that with me and said, would you be interested? Would you be willing to go to lunch with me? And I said, absolutely. Like, would you be willing to just talk with me about these things. So I've had people come over time and just sit over my shoulder and watch, look at the setup, for example, to see stuff or just watch my trades, uh, things like that. And I'm happy to do that. And I think most traders are happy to do that. That's why they're a part of the community. Like they, they want to share what they know. Now, granted, a lot of times, like I'll meet, you know, somebody at church will come and say, can I, can I look over your shoulder and do this? And it's funny, half the time I'm trying to convince them not to do it because they've got a good job and everything else. And they've got teenage children at home or little kids at home. And, and I'm trying to say, well, I'll show you and I'm happy to show you, but don't just quit immediately and start doing this full time. You know, like, like, cause I've, we've had, I've had a few experiences of trying to help people like that and it hasn't worked out for them. And it's been like, uh, don't give up so quick on that paper trade for a while. Make sure this, you know, till you, till you make that jump, make sure you've tested it and that you're feeling good. So, so yeah, I'm not going to be just, yes, yes, this is easy. Like I literally, when I meet with somebody or when they want to talk about it, I tell them the horror stories too, because they need to know that there are horror stories coming. They need to know that there's going to be times where they lose a small house or a car for them or whatever, as far as their value, or they lose a big house or they lose this and how to manage that or how to avoid that as much as you can by your rules and these things. And, and so, um, yeah, it's, you need that kind of community. So you can do it in person. You can reach out or you can message people privately and just ask questions and so on and develop a friendship and a relationship that way. And, and there's just different options and ways to do that. Okay. Thank you. I think that's great advice. And that's one of the really cool features of investors underground is being able to find those traders near you. Yeah. Ryan, one of the other topics that I wanted to touch on was about being able to balance trading and life outside of trading. You know, it sounds like you do a great job of that. So I wanted to ask about your perspective. Uh, how do you think about, you know, trading and getting done what you need to do there but also going out and enjoying life with your family, you know, how do you balance not being so worried about maybe missing out on a stock or a big payday? I could sum it up by saying I started doing this with the idea that it would give me freedom, that it would give me freedom to, to uh, be involved with my kids. It would give me freedom to do stuff with my wife. It would give me freedom to go on vacation. It would give me freedom to live wherever I wanted to live as long as there was internet. It, gave, it would give me freedom to not have a, a boss or have a check-in time or a clock on time. It would give me freedom to do all these things. So with that in mind, because that's why I got into it, I didn't get into it necessarily. Yes, I wanted to make money. I mean, obviously you got to make money to survive and I wanted to make lots of money, but because those were kind of my, that was my thought process. Like, I'm not great at school. I'm not sure about my career. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. This is an opportunity for me to do something from home that I could do in my own schedule and give me that freedom. It meant so much to me, that idea that I've never had a difficulty really in wanting to trade those things for the market. So the market for me is literally just a tool to give me those other things, to give me the freedom. So the, the five children that we raised, like I, I don't think I ever missed 
a track meet or a football game or a basketball game or a piano recital or a whatever it is. And our kids were active. I mean, they they've all been athletes slash, you know, doing other things. And so I was there. Now, I'll be honest, there was a couple of times where I was in the middle of a trade and I took off to go to the cross country meet for my son and I'm running across through the forest to, to cheer for him at a corner and I'm checking my phone real quick because I was still in a position or whatever. But generally, because I'm a day trader for me, I like to go cash and I don't have positions to manage long term. And so I that's what, the way I designed my trading around that freedom. So for me, it was like, oh, I traded for 90 minutes and now one of the kids has a recital thing at school at 10 in the morning. Uh, great. I'm shutting down the computer. I'm all cash. I don't care what happens in the market. And I really like being all cash. So when we go this month coming up in September, we're going on a couple of vacations and we're doing a cruise and, and, and another vacation. And I will probably on the cruise not even get, I will probably not even check the market and not trade. On the other one in Mexico, I might trade a little bit in the morning on my laptop from the hotel, but just while my wife's asleep or whatever, you know, for a few minutes. And, but, but even then, sometimes I just don't want to, I'm like, man, I want to go out and go play in the ocean. And so I, it is only a tool for something greater in my mind. That's what, the way I looked at it. And so it hasn't been, it's easy for me to get away from it because I only did it so that I could get away from it to, to go support my kids or do something. And so if my son texts me, you know, today and says, Hey, there's a hatch on the Provo river. Do you want to go fly fishing? If I'm in a stock I'm like, yeah, Oh yeah. Exit out, done. Shut the stuff down. Let's go fly fishing. Cause that's, that means more to me. And so if, if another son or my daughter says, you want to go hike the mountain up the street, we got mountains all around us here in the Rocky mountains. So it's like, do you, yeah, let's go hike the mountain. I don't, I don't, I only do this so that I can do those other things. Yes. Do I love the challenge of it? Yes. Do I love I, I still, after all these years and thousands and thousands of mornings of getting up, I love walking into the office and seeing what's moving and all those things. I do love the market that way, but I just as easily can turn it off because the things I love more have to do with relationships with people and places and things that are greater than, than the symbols on a, on a screen. That's incredible. And I think that's a very, very great perspective on being able to place trading in the grand scheme of life itself. I think so. As otherwise, if you're living to trade, then I don't, I don't really understand the purpose. I met a guy one time uh, in Vancouver, Washington. He was living in an old folks home and i was visiting another senior lady there just to say hello to her and spend some time with her and i met this guy and he asked me what i did for a living i said i trade the market and he said i traded the market for 40 years and i said you did and he goes yeah and he says i still i still trade and so he took me up to his room at a senior living place and he has two monitors up and <laughs> you know and, uh, you know, they were the old school, like, um, CRT, whatever the ones were, like the big, you know, the back of it is this big you know, and stuff. And so they were pretty old and everything, but he had his little charts going and everything. And this guy was in his eighties. And, and I said, what do you do? He says, I just like to, I still enjoy it. So from time to time, I'll fire up the, the monitors and, and I'll make some trades on Microsoft or things like that. And I'm like, this is awesome because it was cool. Cause where I found him, he was sitting down, the market was open during the day. So it was during market hours and he was sitting down in the couch area chatting with other people, you know, so it wasn't like he had to be there at the screens and yet he had those there and he enjoyed them too. And I thought, I like that. I like that he's spent a great life. He had a wonderful life. He said he was just getting older and couldn't really take care of himself. Yet he still had his mind there to be able to actually make some trades. And we, we exchanged emails and I emailed with him a few times until he passed away. Uh, just like saying, what do you think about this stock or this, that? And I thought, this is awesome. Like, this is, this is so great that somebody that could show me that they did it throughout a lifetime and had a wonderful life and, and not, um, it didn't, but it, yet it didn't consume them, you know, like it's, so you got to have that balance. Cause you try, I think a newer trader, if they're trying to learn the market right now, they're spending so many hours in front of it and they need to, you got to have screen time. You got to learn how to read charts and, and the option chains or the, level two, or you get, just got to learn the setups that you're used to and stuff. And that only comes with time, I think, and exposure. But if you're doing that um, 
And I know you need to do that, but I hope you newer traders, I hope you would say, I'm doing that so that someday I don't have to do that. I'm doing it so that someday I can grab my significant other by the hand and say, let's spontaneously go to Yellowstone or let's let's go on a cruise or let's go do something else or I'm not going to miss my kids' games or I'm not going to miss this because what's the point? What is the point? And I know that old saying about people saying, what's the one about um, nobody ever on their deathbed said, I wish I spent more time at the office or whatever. You know, I don't, and I hope, I hope, you know, heaven willing that I can, that I can trade for the rest of my life. Uh, even if it's mostly for the fun of it, like I don't need the money every day, but just, I enjoy it. And so if there's a setup that I enjoy, why not? I love it. Cause it's fun to challenge yourself and make the trade and do that. There's I, that has never gone away. I still love that as much as I loved it when I first bought BIGM in 1994 and had no clue what I was doing, you know? Um, so, but for your newer, the newer traders, if you can keep in mind that you're doing this for a greater reason, and also by the way, hopefully with the idea that you're going to someday bless other people's lives. Hopefully you can go out in the community and do good things. Hopefully you can give to a traders for a cause or a, a charity that you love. Hopefully you can um, volunteer for something because you can do that during the day and you have time. I mean, money is part of giving, but also time is just as important. You're being there, you know, and so, um, I've had the last little while, I've had some neat experiences and I've been taking my daughter with me and we've been going and doing some just uh, pizza party for the homeless type of stuff, going and giving, just setting up down in a rough area of town where there's a lot of homeless camps and so on, and just meeting people and talking to them and, and giving them a little bit of food and, but mostly giving them kindness and just that they're human, you know, that they, that they're in a tough spot, but that people notice them and so on. And so we just, I feel like we got to make the world a better place as traders if we're going to do it. Because to be honest with you, for example, I have a brother-in-law who's a pediatric dentist and orthodontist. And I mean, he helps little children. He even has part of his setup is for people with, I um, can't remember what you call it, but it would be like autism or different things where he's set up to see them and treat them. And even the way he has the walls set up and things for those that have uh, issues with, with being in, indoors with certain things. He, he's just bent over backwards to be able to do so much good for so many people. And I, I have one of my brother-in-laws is a, is a doctor and a family practitioner in Canada. These guys are doing good all day long for people. Are they being paid? Well, yes, but they're doing good as a trader. I've always kind of thought, man, I'm pretty worthless. I don't actually contribute to society in terms of buying and selling a stock or an option is not contributing to society. Nothing I did in my office today really helped anybody. But if I could leave the office early and go do something out in the community or help somebody else or pick up a friend who who's struggling or help them go get to, go fix their resume to get a job or go do something with your church or go do something else, then, then I'm using what isn't really uh, a, a good uh, there's a, there's no there's no benefit to the world in what I'm doing here. But if it allows me to go do good somewhere else, then it is beneficial. If that makes sense. And so, in and of itself, this stuff means nothing. But if it if you allow it to let it mean something in your life with your family, with your loved ones, with what you can do, and I don't mean just always going and giving. I mean I'm selfish too. Like I we're 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 taking most of September and going on vacations. We we worked hard and we want to do that. And it's like. That, that's part of it too, just enjoying life. I want to go see, we've never been to Fiji. We're, we're taking a cruise from the Hawaiian islands. We're going down to see Fiji and Tahiti and stuff. I've never seen that. I want to see it. And, uh, and so just things like that, where it it's, it's worth it for those things, but also to bless other people's lives and to do good because you're not doing much good in your office, but you can do a whole lot of good in the world with what happens if you click the buttons right in your trading, <laughs> if you do well there. Absolutely, I think that's incredible and exceptionally inspiring, uh, very much within the spirit of Traders for a Cause and everything that that Traders for a Cause is trying to do. And, and, and I just think it's incredible and applaud you for that and being so active in your community and doing more than just thinking about your trading account and the P&L and, and things like that. Yeah. And, and Anthony, one thing real quick to add, I kind of think that when your vision gets a little bit bigger about, I'm not just doing it to pay the bills, but I think it will give me freedom to do other things and to help other people. I think it even makes you a better trader that way because 
you're more patient and more relaxed and you want to find the right setup because it's it's not just about i got to get the money for today once you're at a position where if you're doing a little bit better you can start looking at it as i want to look for a really good setup because i want to be able to really donate to something or do good and i want to make a, a great trade here you like if that makes sense it kind of can help you in your trading career the very idea of doing it not just for me 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 but looking out you know yeah absolutely it gives more purpose to what we yeah. do at the desk right yeah yeah which makes you want to be more disciplined and follow your rules because you don't you're you're thinking it like the other day i made a bad trade and i was and i lost quite a bit and i was like man, I wish I would have just taken all that money and gone to, you know, gone around all the drive throughs around here and tipped each person a thousand dollars at the drive through. And then I gone to a restaurant and tipped somebody a thousand dollars there. I wish I would have just done that all day long. I would have still had more money than the bad trade I made. And there would have blessed so many people's lives. But the point is, if I keep making bad trades, I wouldn't have the money to be able to do any of that. So I have to make good trades in order to be able to do that. And so it's, uh, yeah, one leads to the other. Yeah, that that that's incredible perspective. And if it's okay with you, Ryan, I wanted to end our interview going through a lightning round set of questions, just quick questions and pretty quick answers. Okay, sure. Awesome. The first question I have is, what do you consider to be your greatest strength as a trader? My gut. I, for some reason, I think I was blessed with a gut feel. Even way back in the late 90s, I feel like I other than that first buy that I made, which was blind, but my gut, I just, um, I have a gut feel of when there's a reversal in the markets and things. Yes, the charts help, but there's something also in my gut and looking at all that, that is always that I can't share or explain with people, but just usually is like, yep, it's coming right about here. What's the best piece of trading advice you've ever been given or heard? I don't know if Nate came up with it, but it was a saying that he brought up years ago in a video or something, and I've written it down on my post-it notes and I my rules, but I love, and there's tons of good ones, but I love the one that says, let yourself be right when right and let yourself be wrong when wrong. There's so, there's so many levels to what that means, letting yourself be wrong when wrong, for example, that I struggle with, that it, it's a great, I think it's a great saying. For you, what's the ultimate goal of trading? Freedom. Is there anything that you know now that you wish you knew when you first started trading? Oh, I mean, so much. If I could talk to myself 25 years ago, the one bit of advice I think I would have told myself, which would have made me millions and millions of more dollars is I would have said, when you're right, Ryan, when you're right, keep a portion of your position and let it play out. I struggle with that. I take profits relentlessly to the point that I have none left. And then the big move happens <laughs> that I hoped had hoped for in the first place. So I wish I could. I'm trying to still change that now all these years later, but I wish I would have always just said when I'm right and it's proven right and I've taken my profits, keep some for the what could happen because that alone a thousand times over would have just been huge. What advice would you give to traders who are trying to overcome a big loss or a losing streak? Take a break. Come back to the market when you feel clear headed and have and size down significantly and then wait for your setup. Don't go on your next trade until you see your edge with what you know works for you most of the time and then go in that with a smaller size until you build your confidence back up. And oh, by the way, you don't have to get your full loss back the next day or in the next trade. For traders who are doing well in the market, what advice would you give them in terms of being able to continue trading for as long as you have been? Yeah, balance your life and keep doing what you're doing, but make sure that you're balanced with the rest of what matters in life, your relationships, everything else that you have. It could be your faith, your relationships, your family. Keep those things in 
keep your priorities right or get your priorities right in order to be able to maintain what you're doing and keep doing it for as long as you want. And for those listening who would like to learn more about you or the way that you trade or maybe even contact you, how can they do so? Yeah, like I said, I pretty much never post in in, in investors underground unless um like in the I think I'm a moderator in the OTC chat, but the OTC has been dead for so long, so it haven't really been in there. But um I'm under Harbs. Uh, people call me Harb or Harbs forever because of my last name Harbertson. And so um I'm H A R B S Harbs in in the chat. So feel free to uh, private message me, click on my name, and I'm always happy to respond or answer questions or do anything I can. Incredible. Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. We got to go through a lot, and I think this will be exceptionally helpful for traders who listen. Yeah, it was awesome. I appreciate the chance to chat about it. Nate's been asking me to do an interview for years, and I've always been like, I don't need to I don't have anything to say. There's better traders, everything else. But when we talked about that, we could talk about balance in life and what this is all about. I felt like, okay, well, this is an area I do love. So hopefully it was helpful. And um, I want to, I want everybody to know that's listening. I have so much to improve on. I mean, I have so many weaknesses that I've been working on for so long. It's kind of a lifelong journey for me. I still take profits too quickly. I still don't, I still add to a loser many times. So the quicker you can overcome your weaknesses, the quicker you can turn those into strengths and and do that, the more profitable and, and uh, a better trader you can be. And yet I've been able to do this for two or three decades because I have followed the rules enough to be able to pull it off and be able to have a wonderful life and and have the freedom to to do this. So I encourage everybody to to keep going and keep trying and follow your rules and be patient and know that you know, yet not everybody can do this and you need to recognize if it doesn't work, but paper trade, if you need to simulate an account, whatever, get practice, do all you can and give yourself a chance to see if you can do it. And if you can, um, then you got you have a lot of freedom in your life and it's wonderful and use the freedom well to do good. We hope you enjoyed this interview on the Investors Underground podcast. We have more great interviews that we believe you might also like. So don't forget to subscribe. You'll be notified of upcoming releases the moment they become available. Thanks for watching.